Hi guys and welcome back to Astro Shed. My name is Stuart and in this video we're actually in my Astro Shed because I want to do a walkthrough and talk about my imaging rig which is here to my left. Starting off with the pier, up through the mount and everything else that's mounted on it. I want to talk about it in detail, how it all fits together, how it all works so that in future videos that I do, there will be uh, imaging sessions, you'll know exactly what's going on out here, what I'm using to produce the images and how it's all working together. So let's get into it. Okay, so first of all, you've got my Astro Engineering steel pier bolted to the floor, which is a, bolted to a 2.5 cubic lump of concrete, which, well, the pier is not going to go anywhere. And then I've got this accessory shelf. And also, whether you can notice, there's also a six or eight inch extension on the pier, just to give that bit of extra height, as I'm quite tall. And it's useful if I'm doing things or viewing at the eyepiece just to have that bit of extra height. Pier adapter which is an old pier adapter plate but extremely good it's got a nylon insert in the top which allows the adjustment of this to be very very smooth when you're adjusting the azimuth absolutely brilliant. Uh, this here is just a home built heater 12 volt heater controlled via temperature humidity switch there um, it's also a Wi-Fi switch so I can turn it on and off from indoors uh, and different settings on here. I have it set on about 25 watts and it's just a heat pad between two pieces of metal and the heat sink and I normally have a cover over all this so that just keeps the temperature about 5 degrees above ambient inside the cover just to keep, stop any chance of condensation or anything like that. I only have it on overnight when it's not in use, when the mount's not in use uh, and only through the winter months but it does work well. Around this side we've got the Roy Power 15 amp power supply, again controlled with a Wi-Fi switch so it can be turned on and off from indoors. That then feeds these 12 volt ports which is just one cable connected which goes to the mount and then the 240 volt input four way plug in there so I've got the chance of having four 240 volt outputs if I need them. We move back around and up to the mount it's the EQ8 Pro mount, it's the older version, not the newer EQ8R with the, uh, without the motors on the side like this one has. Um, power cable for the mount and then it's controlled by this Bluetooth adapter. I don't use EQ mod cable, I just use, I use EQ mod, or I have used EQ mod software, but I don't use a cable, I use this Bluetooth. I find it works just as well and it's one less cable to worry about, which is always a good thing. There's always, always much too many cables on, on a mount and if you can do away with one it's always good. Two 10 kilogram counterweights and a specially made counterweight shaft that's shorter than normal so as not to get in the way it's all that's needed. I like to have the weights right up against the mount. It gives better inertia when the mount is slewing much better than having them lower down on, on the shaft get them right up by the mount keep it all compact hence why I've got this much shorter shaft because it's all that's needed. Upgraded saddle, it's a primer loose upgraded saddle. I find it much better, stronger. It's got three separate adjustment knobs that you can see on there. Gives you much better control over the clamping mechanism. And then as you can see I use a side by side setup rather than a piggyback. I find this better especially with this mount because you've got the motors on the right side it's always right side heavy right side as I'm looking at it heavy uh, and this helps to compensate for that it means you can balance it a lot easier than trying to balance a piggyback method this side is obviously a lot heavier due to having the main imaging scope hence why I've got the extra counterweights on, on this side I can screw more on if needed and that works really well so if we move around here you'll see on this side I've got two Losmondy saddles, one on top of another with 40mm spacers between them. This is sitting on a um, Rowan Engineering saddle. I've got one of those each side. Brilliant saddles, dual saddles. And then in between here I've got the Pegasus Ultimate Power Box, which controls and powers everything, and an Intel, an old Intel i3 NUC PC. Pegasus Power Box, can't say enough good things about that, it just does everything. You've got power, due control motor controller and then if we can move around this side 
we've got a USB hub which is USB 2 and 3 uh, a power port that can be adjustable between 3 and 12 volts and also a permanently on 12 volt power port which is used for powering the PC absolutely great system the PC is like I say is an Intel NUC it's an old one it's an i3 I've upgraded the RAM to 16 gigabyte and it's got a 500 gigabyte SSD drive and I remote desktop into that from indoors um, I don't use the onboard Wi-Fi, I use this USB 3 Wi-Fi dongle, works brilliantly, I find the onboard a bit flaky, I've always used this and it works extremely well. And then the scope is the TAC FS60, it's an F5.9 scope, 60mm aperture, I have got the flattener on it which as you can see makes it F6.2. Um, doesn't make an awful difference. I use it obviously as a guide scope. A bit of an overkill as a guide scope, but it also doubles as a solar scope and also as a wide imaging scope, especially with the flattener. So that works well. And then on the back, I've got the ASI 174 guide camera. Uh, this was a re this was what I replaced my Lodestar with due to this having smaller pixels. Found the Lodestar pixels were too big. They're about 5.6 micron on this and the sensor is quite big at about 11 by 7 millimeters I think something like that but you get a great image scale on this for guiding it's about three and a half arc seconds per pixel which is pretty good considering the main imaging rig here is about 1.7 arc seconds per pixel so the two together work well if we can move over to this side we've got the Pegasus focus motor on the main scope. The main scope is a Takahashi FSQ85. That's an F5.3. And as you can see though, I have got a flattener on here, which I'll talk about in a minute, because you're probably wondering, why has he got a flattener when it's an already corrected quadruplet scope? I'll explain that in a minute. And then on the back, I've got the QHY268C, which is about a 15, uh, sorry, a 20, 5 by 15 millimeter sensor, uh, great camera, small pixels, 3.75, and the imaging scale, as I said, is about 1.72 on this, uh, which is just in the sweet spot, to be honest. It works really well. It's a Takahashi camera rotator, so I can manually rotate if needed. Um, and then the handle, which was 3D printed. Uh, which is just it's useful for when I'm carrying it around rather than trying to bear hug the whole thing I can just carry it via the handles, but it works extremely well Now yes the flattener When these scopes were designed they were designed For the cameras that were being used then which were CCD cameras with large pixels and that's what the optics were designed around since we've got these more modern cameras now, <coughs> Excuse me with much smaller pixels with this particular scope, I was getting aberrations in the corners, and apparently it's because the optics weren't designed to be used with such small pixels. So what Takahashi have done is they've brought out this extra corrector. This is now sold as standard with these scopes. I had to buy it as an extra. And this corrects for the problems, the aberrations that you get through using small pixels and the optics in this scope. So yes, it is a already corrected quadruplet scope, and it worked perfectly with my old Starlight Express camera, which had almost 9 micron pixels. But with this camera, like I say, I noticed the problem. When I looked into it, this is what was needed, and this is what they've now produced. And it works extremely well. Absolutely no problems at all. It's corrected the problems with the star shapes in the corners of the images. Got a separation of these are around about 10 inches between the two scopes. So it's quite compact. All the cables fastened down in the middle there with cable connectors focus motor cable all the power cables dew straps they're all in there they're all kept within this area rather than hanging all over the place I do like to keep the cables neat I'm a bit OCD when it comes to that and then there's just the two cables coming down to the camera and then the one main camera that leaves the mount which goes to the 13.8 power supply so all very neat and compact no problems obviously when slewing all the cables move with the top part of the mount the only one I have to be concerned about is the power 
which has never been an issue. And then last but not least, on top of this Takahashi scope, I've got the Deep Sky Dad um, flats panel. This doubles obviously as a, as a dust cap as well, but it's absolutely brilliant. It's all 3D printed, can't praise it enough. USB, USB control has its own driver and software, and it also can be controlled from within Nina. And uh, obviously power, it also has a manual button to open and close it. It opens to 270 degrees. It has hundreds and hundreds of, of settings on the light panel, so you can literally get flats using any filter. You can have it extremely bright or extremely dim, depending on what filter you're using. There's loads of settings, so you can use the dynamic brightness or the, or the uh, auto exposure settings within Nina for taking your flats. Again, all fully controllable from inside. Absolutely brilliant. And the fact that it's all 3D printed as well. Well, it's great. I suggest you take a look. They uh, do them for most scopes, but if there isn't one for your scope, you drop them a line, they'll certainly look into producing one. They're very, very helpful, good people to deal with, and are highly recommended. So I think that just about covers everything. It's a great setup, it's compact, neat, it always works, will always work very well for me. I have had to adjust some of the backlash on the on the deck axis on this mount, but that's pretty normal on the older EQ8s. I think it's still the same on the newer ones to be quite honest. But it's not it's not a major problem. Um, I get regular guiding at 0 0.3, 0 0.4 and most of the time it's 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which imaging at an image scale of 1.7, uh, getting an RMS, anything under 0 0.8, 0 0.9 is, is great. No problems at all with star shapes or anything like that. One last look around it. The next thing is a few items I've got in the observatory itself and the first thing is this Eco Air Dehumidifier. I wanted to let you guys know about these because it's absolutely brilliant. I don't use it an awful lot but this is a desiccant dehumidifier and the difference between a desiccant and a condensing one is yes they cost a bit more to run but the upside is they'll work right down to one degree and they also heat the air that passes through it is slightly heated when it comes out and this is because the desiccant which takes the water out of the air is dried inside using a heater and then that air is expelled back into the atmosphere in the observatory which is slightly warmed due to the fact that it's been heated to dry the desiccant inside the uh, dehumidifier it's about 240 watts of power it takes um, but you don't need it on for long. In an hour it can remove nearly a litre of water. So again this is fitted with a Wi-Fi switch down there on the floor so it can be turned on and off from inside the house as and when I need it. I don't use it that often but I usually do use it after an imaging session. You'll also notice I've got two cameras. I've got one here which is part of my home CCTV blink system which is on all the time just to monitor it. And then over here I've got another camera which is just a cheap £20 IP camera and this is only used when I'm actually imaging and I've got the roof open and I'm using the kit. This gives me a little window in Nina that actually shows me what's going on in here. It shows me my scope, it shows when it's slewing to make sure there's no accidents or crashes with the pier and it's a great little camera and I'd really recommend one if you've got an observatory. £21 I think it was off Amazon. It's got pan and tilt features as well. It's a 2K resolution and it gives a great image over the internet, like I say, to have that window in Nina to be able to see it while you're imaging is absolutely great. Highly recommended. Okay, so that's it, a complete walkthrough of my imaging rig from top to bottom. I hope you found it useful or interesting. If so, please give me a thumbs up. If you've got any questions or anything you want to know, or even any advice as to how I can do things differently or better, then please leave them in the comments, I'd like to hear from you. So until next time, thanks for watching, clear skies, see you again.